In biology, scientists are always taking measurements and recordings. If you give them a test tube filled with unknown liquid, they want to know what is in it and how much. For this, they have a set of experiments called assays. Assay development is so common and valuable that it features as a skill in LinkedIn and might even land you a job. The number of assays known is staggering. The number and kind of biomolecules are increasing, the type of environments to measure them in are increasing, and the requirements for specificity and efficiency are changing. So the assays are constantly evolving and new ones are being developed to match or even set the pace of science. In this video, we will talk about a simple biomolecular assay called nucleic acid estimation. During my PhD, I used to grow bacterial cells called E. coli all night so that I could get more than 100 million cells. I would use all these cells and isolate double-stranded DNA. At the end of the DNA preparation, I would expect to have double-stranded DNA in a tube. So what do I do with it? I measure what's in my tube and how much. And what do I use for that? An assay, of course. I used the most popular assay for DNA estimation. This assay was based on light absorption. Now what does light absorption have to do with the identity and quantity of a biomolecule? Two scientists worked with such questions in the 1800s and gave us what we know today as the Beer-Lambert's law. This law states that the absorption of light is directly proportional to the concentration C of the absorbing molecule in the solution and the distance that the light travels in the solution, that is, the path length L. It has been seen that several biomolecules absorb light at different wavelengths. For example, nucleotides which make up DNA and RNA absorb light at 260 nanometers. Proteins absorb light at 280 nanometers. Now both these wavelengths lie in the UV range. Several other biomolecules such as chlorophyll absorb light in the visible range. These wavelengths add specificity to these assays and in principle allow us to specifically measure absorbance by nucleic acids, proteins, chlorophylls and several other biomolecules. Think about how you can design an instrument and measure absorbance of a biomolecule in solution. In the 1940s, scientists and engineers at the Beckman Coulter, a company renowned for the instruments it makes, developed an instrument to measure absorbance of a sample in solution. This instrument was called as the spectrophotometer or the SPEC. This instrument was initially built to measure absorbance of wavelengths in the visible range. A prism was used to split white light and a monochromator was used to select the exact wavelength that should fall on the sample. The deuterium lamp was added later for UV light. Optics control the direction of light and the photodiodes measure the transmitted light. The final output is provided by the software as transmitted light or the amount of absorption by the sample. For example, the graph here shows absorbance spectrum of DNA over a range of wavelengths. It shows that DNA absorbs maximally but not exclusively at 260 nanometers. The path length was standardized using specially designed sample holders of 1 cm width called the cuvettes. These cuvettes usually require a sample volume of 250 to 1000 microliters. So often the samples have to be diluted in water or buffer and measured thereafter. For working with visible light, one can use cuvettes made out of glass or plastic. But both these materials absorb UV light. Therefore, for measuring absorbance from DNA, one has to use a quartz cuvette. So once you have the path length and absorbance values, how do you determine the exact concentration of the sample? For this purpose, it is essential to know the extinction coefficient or epsilon of the absorbing molecule at the respective absorbing wavelength. Extinction coefficients determine the efficiency of the assay. Now take a moment to think, how is the efficiency affected by the hardware or software of the spectrophotometer? Or how is it affected by the sample volume used for this assay? Okay, so the extinction coefficient of nucleic acids can be determined from its constituent basis. But for most practical purposes now, the epsilon value for DNA and RNA are those as shown on the screen. Note that the epsilon values of double-stranded and single-stranded DNA are different. This happens because the nucleotides in the two single strands form base-stacking interactions when they exist as a duplex. 
Because of this, the absorbance of double-stranded DNA is less than the sum of two single-stranded DNA strands. This effect is called the hypochromic effect. What do you think happens to atoms and nucleotides such that the physical changes like double strand formation affect the absorbance of the molecule? DNA measurements using UV spec have been utilized for decades for downstream experiments such as cloning, heterologous protein expression, biomolecular interaction studies, nucleic acid hybridization experiments, etc. For most commercial spectrophotometers, the reliable absorbance recordings range from 0.1 to 1.5. Thus, the range of DNA concentration that can be estimated using UV spec lies between 5 to 75 micrograms per milliliters. Most of the downstream experiments require purified DNA preparations to be devoid of proteins. A value of 1.8 for the ratio of absorbances measured at 260 nanometers over 280 nanometers indicate a DNA sample devoid of proteins. For RNA samples, this value should be 2. Other contaminants such as chaotropic salts and organic solvents can be detected at 230 nanometers. High readings at 320 nanometers indicate turbidity of solution and possible presence of other contaminants. Think about if you can distinguish between single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA and RNA in a sample using the UV spec. Now let's fast forward to when all the labs already have a spectrophotometer. But scientists want something better. They want to increase the range of detection, decrease the sample volume, decrease the time taken, but not add time to the sample preparation. Whew, that's a tough one. Take a moment and pause this video and think what can be done. Where will you start looking for answers? Alright, let's go to the basics. Let's go back to the Beer-Lambert's law and see what we can tweak there. So the epsilon, we know that it is a constant and depends on the biomolecule. So let's not touch that. Absorbance and concentration are variables and depend on the sample preparation. We leave those alone as well. L, the path length. Can we do something here? Maybe if we can reduce the path length, we can increase the dynamic range of the instrument. And that's what four people who founded the company called the Nanodrop Technologies did. A nanodrop shown here in the picture is a very simple instrument to use. It requires a scientist to use one to two microliter of the precious sample and apply it directly onto the optical pedestal without any dilutions or extra reagents. This drastically reduces the time taken to do the experiment, which means lesser sample degradation. When the lid is closed, it forms a small path length due to surface tension. The path length is of the range 0.5 to 1 mm. Due to a low path length, the dynamic range of detection increases to 5 to 10,000 micrograms per milliliter. Nanorop is now widely used in everyday molecular biology applications to measure DNA and RNA in biological samples or samples purified from a variety of sources or synthesized in vitro. So where do we stand today? Are there new requirements in the field which require new innovations? The answer to that question is yes. In recent years, molecular biology has taken an interesting turn. Scientists have discovered that DNA and RNA taken from individual cells of a tissue or cell culture can show variations. Therefore, genomic studies are now being carried out at the single cell level. Total DNA or RNA obtained from a single cell is very low in quantity. For example, DNA from a single human cell amounts to approximately 6 picograms. Therefore, for performing such experiments reliably and reproducibly, it has become important to develop assays with higher specificity and efficiency. In these experiments, it's also essential to distinguish between double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA and RNA, as well as between intact nucleic acids and nucleotides in a given sample. The assays developed for this purpose used another property of light, called fluorescence or spectrofluorimetry. When a selected wavelength of light falls on molecules, the energy absorbed moves electrons from ground state to an excited state. Before this electron returns to ground state, it loses energy in non-radiative forms as vibration and heat. Subsequently, the electrons return to ground state by emitting photons of light of a longer wavelength than the excitation wavelength. 
Both these wavelengths are controlled and detected using a spectrofluorimeter. Molecules which exhibit fluorescence are called fluorophores. Several fluorophores, for example, ethidium bromide and cyanine-based dyes are used for detecting nucleic acids. These dyes exhibit very low fluorescence by themselves, but upon binding to nucleic acids, they undergo conformational changes which increases their fluorescence by 20 to 1000 fold. Fluorescence-based nucleic acid estimation assays, for example the qubit assay from a company called Invitrogen, can distinguish between double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA and RNA in a sample. This assay is provided as a standardized, easy-to-use kit and the scientist is not informed about the exact reaction reagents and chemistries. Nevertheless, this assay is now an accepted standard in the field of single-cell genomics. Think about how does one decide to communicate their discoveries as articles in journals versus patents. What are their requirements, advantages and disadvantages? To summarize, here are the detection ranges and some of the properties of the methods we discussed in this video to measure nucleic acid quantities. I hope you liked this video and if you did, you might also like to play a trivia game on Kahoot about nucleic acid estimation. So just click on the link below and get started. Have fun and goodbye.